The Strange Men anthology has had some tonal shifts as the entries go on. The Crooked Man was a dark and serious story, while its sequel, The Sandman, was far more jovial. I personally liked both of these games. They both had good stories with positive messages. Despite the drastic changes in tone, it still feels like a relatively natural progression. So where did the series go next? The third entry in the series, The Boogeyman, released in 2015 with a much darker appearance than its predecessors. All the promotional materials and descriptions are far more gritty. Here's the plot summary from the translator's website. Keith Baring is a cold, devoted detective whose boss decides he needs to take some time off. While on a tour of an old castle with his wife Helena, she makes a startling confession to him. Keith goes to bed bewildered, but things only become stranger as the boogeyman's game begins. That's right, we get to witness somewhat of a death game. Death games are one of those weird sub-genres in storytelling that really interest me, so I'm greatly looking forward to this entry. This game intertwines with the plot of both The Crooked Man and The Sandman, so make sure to watch my videos on the previous two before this one, I will link the playlist here. One last thing, there's a high chance that I'm going to make no money from this video, which sucks because of how much effort I put into these. My video on The Crooked Man was age-restricted despite containing no offensive or harmful content, unless you believe a game with the purpose of discouraging suicide and preaching that there will always be a reason to continue living is harmful. Because of this, I would really appreciate it if you consider checking out my Patreon. There's a link in the card to a video with more information, but to summarize, you can get a ton of behind-the-scenes content as well as your name at the end of videos. Now let's hop into the game. Keith Baring, a 37-year-old detective, is on a stakeout with his partner, Eric. He ignores the ringing of his phone, as he always does. This habit has placed him under scrutiny more than once. The duo's target appears on the scene, and Keith immediately jumps into action. We cut to Keith getting a talk from his boss, Dick. A local news source is completely bending the truth and leaving out critical information in their reports, making it the fourth time Keith has been targeted like this. Dick thinks Keith could use a break and is assigning him a mandatory month-long vacation. He even gives him tickets to a tour of an old castle. Keith isn't particularly happy about this development, but he doesn't exactly have a choice. Something interesting about this game compared to its predecessors is that it's fully voice acted from start to finish. You can definitely tell that the voice actors aren't professional, but a few of them stand out as quite good. I particularly liked the performances for Richard and Lance, two of the characters that you'll meet later. Another pretty good performance is that of Dick, who was actually voiced by Manly Badass Hero, a popular YouTuber. Something else to note about the voice acting are the varying microphone qualities. Some voices are very clear while others sound distant and echoey. Some characters even transition between having good and bad quality depending on what line you're hearing. I don't know if they just got closer to the mic for these lines or what, but it was a clear improvement, albeit a short-lived one. Keith returns home to his wife, Helena, who he unapologetically brushes off while she tries to show him concern. She seems quite excited for the tour. Two weeks later, the trip has arrived and they speak with Stevie, their tour guide. He escorts them to a ferry for the five-hour ride to the island where the castle is located. Helena wants to introduce herself to the other guests and invites Keith along, but he brushes her off once again. I know they're probably setting up some big character arc for him, but man, I do not like Keith so far. He's been really disrespectful towards everyone who seems to care about him. Keith decides to leave the room, opening his door and almost hitting someone, despite the fact that the doors are clearly indented into the wall to prevent exactly this from happening. The girl throwing a fit is Sophie Grundler, of all people. They start arguing, but are stopped by Sophie's father, Richard. He makes her apologize and she walks away. Richard is a super friendly and down-to-earth guy, in contrast to Sophie's temper. Keith moves along, stumbling across Helena talking with Shirley, who is now David's wife. David is out smoking on the ship's west deck, so Keith joins him. They have a pleasant talk, and we learn that the Grundlers are here as his guests. On the east deck, Keith meets Lance Canal, a sleazy reporter and a total creep. Guided by Stevie, the group finally arrive at the castle and can begin their tour. A knock on the door and some hectic squabbling later, Brendan, the owner of the place, lets everyone in. He seems to know a lot about the guests. He shows them to their rooms where they'll be able to wait until dinner. In the Baring's room, Helena gushes about how beautiful the area is. Keith ignores another call from Eric, then declines an invitation from his wife to go mingle with the others. He instead looks around the castle, locating a study detailing the rather disturbing history of the castle. Brendan runs into him, elaborating on the history but saving some of the details for tomorrow's tour. Suppose Supposedly, he inherited this castle after the deaths of his parents, turning it into a tourist destination. Dinner is finally ready, and the group dynamic is established through some banter. Everybody immediately seems to be getting along, although Keith has to depart early after getting yet another phone call from Eric. Sophie notes that he always seems sad, and inquires about it. What is he, a robot? Haha, <laughs> a robot detective? So he's robo- Ow! 
Keith's call is unimportant, and Dick quickly finds out about it and tells him to get back to enjoying his vacation. He returns to his room to find Helena crying. She tries to rush off to bed, but Keith shows some empathy for once and asks what's wrong. Helena wants a divorce. Keith softens, asking if she hates him, but he just gets the it's not you, it's me response. She says she loves him, then goes to sleep. We cut to some of the other guests. Lance is talking up a big game about getting dirt on Keith, while Sophie, Richard, David, and Shirley settle down for the evening. Here's an example of the audio quality for some of David's lines fluctuating. Hey, just enjoy yourself. You won't have any fun worrying over everything. We'll make some great memories. What about your memories with me? We could always use more. Keith's phone is ringing, but he can't find it anywhere. When he decides to check the bedroom, Helena is nowhere to be seen. A note lays on the floor in the entrance claiming a wonderful show is about to take place in the entrance hall. Keith finds the entrance hall covered in red graffiti. A man approaches from behind. He has a bag over his head with a bloody smile scrawled on the front. He displays hands outfitted with claws, introducing himself as the Boogeyman, the organizer of a marvelous game soon to begin. The game in question is quite simple. The Boogeyman will attempt to kill every guest on the tour while Keith tries to stop him. He even provides an example, cleaving the head from the shoulders of an unconscious and tied up Brendan before dropping the body into a pit. The Boogeyman sprints off, leaving Keith to find and rescue the other guests before it's too late. This setup is a lot darker than the others, and honestly, I love it. It plays heavily into the concept of a locked room murder mystery where the characters in danger are the ones that the player cares about. In fact, your ability to save the previous protagonists heavily alters what ending you get. The setup isn't all that I like so far. I've played quite a few RPG Maker games on the channel recently, but none of them have had better visuals than the Strange Men anthology. I love how Uri commits to a consistent pixelated style. It's timeless and it flows a lot better than some of the other combinations I've seen. Keith stumbles upon the body of a servant with a corkscrew in the head, but cannot take it. He finds a wrench hammer as well as a note on a door with a sealed keyhole that says, did you already open that red wine I prepared? Only now can Keith take the corkscrew and use it to break open the lock. I despise when puzzle games do this. I've always felt that if an important item is laying about, you should be able to pick it up at any time so you know it's a resource that you can take into account. This also prevents needless backtracking. The note on the door made it clear what to do, so it wasn't too tedious to go back and grab it, but it's still irritating that I couldn't just take it in the first place. This problem worsens as the game progresses, with the biggest offender being during a timed sequence that alters the ending of the game. The now unlocked room is pitch black. Keith can hear Stevie mumbling, turn on the lights, over and over again from somewhere inside, and he decides to follow the advice to avoid any possible traps. After finding the breaker and flicking the switch, he activates the lights, finding Stevie tied to a chair. He has severe back wounds and appears to be listening to a message from the boogeyman on a tape player. Turn on the lights. Repeat. Turn on the lights. That's the way, Stevie. You're a real great tour guide. Now keep repeating. You have to finish your job if you want to go back to your wife in Connecticut. Oops, someone's eavesdropping on our conversation. Detective, you took your time, didn't you? You did this? Thought I told you I prepared a tutorial. Now you should have a real good grasp of the way this game goes. In short, you go too slow, the others end up like this, too. Stevie did such a good job, showed you just what you needed to do. Did you kill those servants, too? Oh, they're just for show. Making it look good helped spice the game up. I'll let you off the hook there, since they kicked it while you were still snoozing away. So what do you think? Gotten you a little more motivated, detective? Or maybe I'm making you quiver in your boots. Where'd you take the others? It'd be no fun in games if I told you that. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got a lot to get done. Good luck, detective, cause for you nothing could be a bigger disgrace than failing to save someone you could have, right? I love the characterization of the boogeyman. He really feels manic here, and it only gets better as the game goes on. Keith tries to talk to Stevie, but he can barely get a response. He grabs the key for the second floor, promising the pain will be over soon. Stevie proceeds to bleed to death. To get the true ending, you need to find many secret scenes scattered throughout the events of the game. My overview will detail them as though they're a normal part of the plot, but I'll still show every bad ending and describe how to get them. Keith retrieves a videotape from a servant's corpse, as well as a theater key from the mouth of a taxidermy fish. He uses the theater room to watch the tape, the contents of which show Helena being chased around by the boogeyman. He's clearly playing with her life, allowing her to escape to prolong the game further. 
Next, Keith visits the servants' quarters, where a note on the wall has a passcode for a control panel that will release the stairs to the third floor. Putting this code in doesn't actually lower the staircase, it just gives Keith a new clue. Boogie gets you in a super trance, you get high on the boogie. This clue, combined with the oddly colored numbers on the panel, is supposed to direct Keith towards a record room where he can look at the colors of the word boogie on the album art to figure out which numbers to input. With the stairs now released, Keith ascends to the third floor, finding a room full of armor stands. Being careful not to get too close, Keith navigates through the room. A painting on the back wall indicates that three swords combined are important in some way. Two from the sides, one from above. Fortunately, Keith can move some of the armor stands to make that exact pattern. They swing their swords downwards, breaking the flooring and revealing a bit key. Keith uses his wrench hammer to enter the door to the west, as well as the bit key to unlock what looks like a cell door. At the bottom of the stairs, he finds Helena on the other side of some prison bars. He tries to move the bars to no avail, and Helena runs away, asking him to wait for her because she'll be okay. Let's take a moment to talk about these staircases as Keith returns to the previous room. You cannot just hold the direction that you want to go and automatically ascend up the stairs. You have to go up, and then to the side, then up, then to the side, then up, then to the side, rinse and repeat until you finally manage to reach the top. This is especially annoying when we get to the puzzles with time limits later down the line, but for now, it's just a minor inconvenience. Keith heads north to a room covered in green graffiti this time, prying an old axe from the wall. This is when my screen recording gave out on me, something that happens quite a few times during this video. Because of this, I had to gather some footage from online to fill in the gaps. All the videos used are credited on screen and in the description, so please go give them some support. Keith moves to the next room, finding Lance tied to a table with a saw above his head. The boogeyman slashes at Lance's legs as punishment for fighting back before activating the saw and abandoning them. Keith breaks down the door, finding and using the key to Lance's restraints before the saw can lower enough to hurt him. Keith relays everything that happened, which panics the reporter. Despite his injuries, Lance follows Keith as they look for more endangered guests. Prying the sideboard off a toppled shelf, our duo navigate down the halls, finding a bird emblem with a missing eye. Further down the hall is a doll sitting in a wheelchair holding a gun. Keith convinces Lance to use the metal as a shield while he sneaks around the side to take it out. I'm fairly certain Lance should be littered with holes after that, but he seems fine, so let's move on. They find a room with statues of lambs, a sheepdog, and a hawk. A note on the ground tells them to put the lambs as far away from the predator as possible, which is easy enough with a little bit of elbow grease. Now that the animals are safe, a gun falls to the floor, and Keith uses it to destroy the hawk's head, freeing the eye for use at the previously aforementioned door. This brings them to another boogie event, where Sophia and Richard are suspended above a spike pit. The second Keith pulls one of them to safety, the other will be dropped down to their death. Keith and Lance move back down to the floor below, where they can access the pit, pushing a table on top of the spikes. The table sits below where Sophie would land. On Keith's orders, Lance pulls Richard to safety, dropping Sophie in the pit. Keith jumps into the pit himself, grabbing her and rotating himself into the lower position to cushion her fall. Now that there's a group of survivors, it's no longer safe to move around. Keith can't monitor everyone at once, after all. They locate a temporary safe room, and everyone stays behind except for Keith. Lance is left with a wrench hammer for protection. Keith moves through the halls, vaulting over a hole in the floor and moving downwards to a branching path. One has an electrified floor, while another has two weapons to choose from, a saw and a hammer. Keith grabs the saw and backtracks to a suspicious-looking statue in the hall near the doll. He cuts off its head, finding a heart key. This is used to disable the electric floor, allowing for safe passage. On the other room lies a room with a tape player and a piece of rope alongside graffiti stating, go under. Keith takes the rope as well as the advice on the floor, tying it to a lighting fixture and descending into the pit he jumped over previously. Inside is another videotape displaying Helena's status. This time, she is cornered in a room and is tackled by the boogeyman, barely being able to escape. Keith moves across the hall, finding the body of a decapitated dog and a clue on the wall relating to getting the hammer that was left behind. Keith notes the code and retrieves his prize, moving up the stairs and finding David unconscious on a walkway outside. David immediately panics, frantically looking around for Shirley. We flash back to David finding Shirley, unconscious on the floor of their room before he's attacked by the boogeyman himself. That's all he remembers before waking up. Keith believes the boogeyman took Shirley as bait. He tells David to go to the safe room, but David is too stubborn for that, demanding to come along and help find Shirley. The next room has a multicolored tile floor that causes different things to happen when you step on the wrong ones. Some are less harmful than others. They reach the other side, and Keith destroys the electronics controlling the floor. He grabs a knife from one of the mechanisms in the wall, pocketing it for later use. As they explore further, the duo find the boogeyman cornered in a hallway. Oh no. Looks like I've been cornered by Mr. Detective. Back to the wall. Nowhere to run. It's like the end of a chase scene, straight from a movie. Now let's see, you'd be Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman. So I'm John Doe, hmm? 
Where'd you take Shirley? Hey, are you the guy that kidnapped Shirley? Where is she? Ah, so nice to see you, David. Can't help worrying about your wife, I see. Worry not, you'll meet her very soon. Sooner than you think. So then, here I have a box. Surprise, a gift from me to you. I'd like David to open it, if possible. I'm sure he'll be stunned. Well, anyway, you two, take your time and enjoy the present. Keith opens up the box despite David's fears. Wait. Don't. If you open that, d don't open it, please! Stop! Thought so. David is justifiably upset by the fakeout, but Keith calms him down. They continue off in search of their wives, finding Shirley tied to a cross in a nearby chapel. The boogeyman is waiting nearby, taunting David over his reaction to the box. He sets the room ablaze. David immediately douses himself in water and sprints through the flames towards Shirley. Keith tosses him the knife to remove the restraints, but the fire continues to spread. The boogeyman reveals that he knows a lot about David and Shirley's past, taunting them from the ceiling before leaving them to die. Keith sprints through the halls, locating the hatch the boogeyman used to access the ceiling, and breaking a pipe inside to douse the flames. Shirley is brought back to the safe room where she wakes up. Keith moves to search for Helena once again, but David wants to go with. Keith insists that he stay behind to protect Shirley, proving that he doesn't know Shirley all that well. She grabs an axe from the wall, ready to defend the entire group if need be. David reinforces the idea that Shirley can handle herself, with Keith finally backing down. They move through the chapel, their only way forward being shimmying along a pipe outside. There's a room nearby from which Keith retrieves an old music box key. This is used in a matching keyhole on a piano, revealing a mechanism for a secret passageway. Keith goes in alone, asking David to keep watch. He moves around, finding and reading a note on the floor until he's interrupted by a familiar voice from behind. Hey, detective. Up to your silly profiling, it seems. Say, why don't I try doing the same? You're always carrying a little box with you. A precious little black box. A treasure trove of all you hold dear. Don't you notice the smell from that box? It's, you know what it is, don't you? Do you think you're better than me? Do you want to kill me or befriend me? I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Who do I pray to to straighten out this crooked tongue? Keith returns to David and they leave the room. Nearby, Richard's voice can be heard calling out for Sophie. After locating the sound of the voice, Keith warns that Sophie disappeared from the room when no one was looking. As they try to calm Richard down, the boogeyman taunts him even more, revealing that he knows about Miss Grundler's death. The boogeyman seems to know far too much about all of these guests. The group returns to the safe room. Apparently, Sophie went into the bathroom and never came back out. Keith notes a loose vent cover and connects the dots quite quickly. Sophie wasn't taken, she left on her own. Richard is a worried wreck, but Keith promises they'll find Sophie and bring her back safely. They move outside the castle and hear Sophie screaming from a nearby building. Keith brings out the axe from earlier to break down the door. We're plunged into a flashback showing Sophie worrying about Helena's safety. Apparently they had a talk earlier in the night where Sophie expressed sadness over the inability to fall in love. She's lonely, but she doesn't feel romantically inclined towards anyone. She's jealous of people like David and Shirley who are happy together while she's left alone. Because of this, she wants to know why Helena and Keith got together. Maybe it can lead her to an answer. You know, love is like a jewel. It's buried deep in a person's heart, and one day you just dig it up. Feelings like love and sympathy can create all different kinds of jewels, so jealousy, anger, and pride can shatter them too. Have you ever found such a jewel? Yeah, but I got rejected. <sighs> Don't worry, you'll find it again. I hope you can make a wonderful jewel someday. So what's your jewel like, Helena? Mine is already complete. I don't want to meddle with it anymore. I just want to keep it deep in my heart. 
Let's think back to the Sandman for a moment. In that game, Sophie used a machine to extract one of many jewels from her head. In the true ending for that game, it was revealed that the Sandman held onto it for a little while, wanting to give it back to her later on. What if this pink jewel was the part of Sophie's mind that allowed her to love? Hence why she doesn't seem to have any romantic interests. We cut back to Sophie climbing through the vents in search of Helena. As she enters a room, a familiar hand reaches out and grabs her by the shoulder. This mirrors a scene from the Sandman that I didn't show in my video. In that game, Sophie had a scary interaction while hiding in a closet. A hand grabbed her while she was peeking out, one that's incredibly similar to what we just saw. Did she have an interaction with the Boogeyman during that game? Sophie backs away. The Boogeyman chastises her for worrying her father. Where's Helena? Sophie, are you mad at me? It's been so long since our last meeting. What are you talking about? Don't you remember? We've met time after time, in every bad dream you had as a child. I'll take you to the world inside the closet. This is making me even more certain that we saw him in the previous game. The Boogeyman sticks a pack of dogs onto Sophie. Before any damage can be done, every dog in the room tumbles to the floor asleep. Keith and David break down the door. Sophie tries to describe what happened to them, but it's quite unbelievable that the dogs just all suddenly fell asleep. It's almost as if a certain fairy is still watching over her after the last game. Before she can voice this thought, Keith berates her over how inconsiderate she was towards her father, and asking why she didn't do what he told her to. They return to the safe room, and Sophie apologizes to everyone. Keith thinks back to the past, to another time when another kid didn't do what he told them to. He and a young boy sit in the kitchen of his home. Haven't I told you not to play in here? What if a pot or a knife fell on you? Sorry, Dad. So, why were you playing around here? Um, I was playing policeman, and, um, it's snowing today. So? This mat here is white and fluffy, like snow, so... Do you want to join the police, Todd? Yeah, I want to be a policeman like you, Dad. <laughs> well, well. But a policeman has to follow the rules. A boy who breaks rules can't join the force. It's the law. Well, unless you have connections, right? Connections? Who taught you a word like that? You did, Dad. Well then, you'll join the force with your connections. That's a lame way to do it. Lame? Yeah, some of my buddies got in by connections. But they're all dumb, unpopular, and really lame to boot. You want to be a lame policeman, Todd? Nuh-uh, I'll be a cool policeman. There's no relying on connections, or playing pretend in the kitchen. Mom should be back from shopping soon. Let's go meet her. Okay, don't want Mom to run into any swindlers. Dad and I'll protect her. Swindlers? Now who taught you that one? You did that. Right. Well, let's go. Are we taking the car? I've got a better idea. Oops, sorry. Keith? What's the matter? Just thinking about my son. You... have a son? He's dead. Keith doesn't elaborate, and David isn't willing to ask. They move into the hallway outside the room where Sophie and Richard were suspended, hearing footsteps at the end of the hallway. The only place they could have gone to is a large hole in the upper half of the wall. David helps lift Keith through the opening. Keith hears a phone ringing as he navigates the halls. To the east, he finds a room with information on his boss, the man who was originally supposed to go on this trip. Footsteps can be heard outside, so Keith quickly hides in the corner. The boogeyman walks through the door, and Keith tackles him. After putting up with some delightfully disgusting comments about his wife, Keith is tasered by the monster and left on the floor. An unknown amount of time passes. Helena is here now, leaning over him and being cryptic. When Keith awakens, no one is there. A recording of the boogeyman speaking to Helena is in the hallway alongside a note reading, you just want to hear her? Helena sounds confused. Someone is tied up and screaming in the background, although they sound as though they've been gagged. The boogeyman the man uses this person as an example as to what will happen to Helena if she allows herself to be caught by him. The confusion turns to fear and panic as a gunshot rings out.
out. She begs for Keith, but the boogeyman claims that her husband is in his grasp now. Keith begins to wonder if he was the one on the inside of the cell during his last interaction with Helena. Keith looks around even more, at the sound of a phone ringing playing periodically. He finds a key next to another corpse, this one much older than the others, before returning to a worried David. Keith was gone for a very long time after all. They move through the halls once more, being taunted by the boogeyman. He targets David once again, making jokes about his mother's death. Keith tells David to ignore him and move on, but David is infuriated by the boogeyman's words. Keith insults him, causing a spat that didn't really last all that long once David finally took a moment to actually listen. Keith breaks down the door and retrieves a key from inside. It doesn't take long for the boogeyman to appear again. He drops the floor from beneath David, separating the two. Keith keeps getting in the way, so the boogeyman took things into his own hands. The room begins to fill with gas. David grabs a curtain and covers his mouth with it. He and Keith scramble to find a meeting point, but David finds only a locked door. Keith only has two minutes to free David. Moving through the room with the rotting corpse, Keith sees the door that David is locked behind as well as a key behind an assortment of blades. If he grabs the key without a layer of protection, he will die before being able to save David. This time I looked around for anything I could that would work as even the thinnest layer of protection. I found a towel but couldn't pick it up, so David ended up dying on this run. I tried over and over again, but I couldn't pick up any items that I thought would work. As it turns out, this was another example of needing a clue before being allowed to pick up items for the puzzles. You can't pick up the towel unless you've seen the key in the knives. Keith rescues David and both collapse outside before deciding to move on in search of Helena. Keith is clearly no longer well. David pretends to be in need of a break to force the detective to take a moment to rest. The heck is that guy anyway? How does he know about my mom? And Shirley's past? It's really disturbing. David, did you celebrate your birthday with Shirley last month? Or was it with Paul and Marion? Oh, I scheduled a meal with Shirley, then celebrated with Paul and Marion the other- Huh, did I ever tell you my friends' names? Sorry about your mother. Brain tumors are like a landmine. One misstep means trouble. But I guess they don't teach you how to dodge landmines in flight school, huh? What? Oh, and you want to toughen your stomach for anchovies and liver. I mean, unless you want younger girls thinking that's cute or whatever. Hold on a second. What do you know about my mom, too? And my friends in school? I never told you any of that, right? Keep this between us. But working as a detective for 15 years, you get to know stuff. Like what someone's done in the past, just by looking at their faces. Maybe that big-headed freak is the same way. You're kidding, right? You think I'm kidding? You're a real sucker. Take care you don't get swindled someday. What's this about? What do you know all about me? You were taken to the police after the incident with your mother. Remember the detective who questioned you? I was pretty dazed at the time, so I don't really remember. But it wasn't you, was it? Eric Simpson, my subordinate. It was only an attempted crime, so he was the only one to handle you. And you know, he's got a real messy desk. He lets case files and the like pile up so high, they even topple over onto my desk. I saw some files on you among them. Your history, your family, that kind of info, and your mother's diagnosis. Oh, and the ones who verified your identity were your friends Paul and Mary and Martin. I remember them well, especially because that Paul guy made a huge ruckus at the station. He was the one that ate too many chili dogs too, right? Then the anchovies. Oh yeah, I mentioned that at dinner. But I didn't tell you I hated liver, did I? I hate anchovies myself, and I hate liver. That's all. Why did you make a guess for that one? Because you're stupid enough that I thought it'd fool you. If you know so much about me, why didn't you say so when we first met? Because I was suspicious of you. Huh? Me? Why? A year and a half ago, you found a hanged body in an abandoned house in another state. The state police came to us trying to determine the guy's identity. That's when I read your testimony, and it was real sketchy. Sketchy? Why? I understand you were looking for the guy who formerly lived in your apartment, but how did you track him down without even knowing his name, or what he looked like? 
said you followed notes, but when you were asked to show them, you said you lost them. You said you shot a man in the house, but there was no gunpowder on the gun, no dropped cartridges, most importantly, nobody to shoot. And then you just happened to find that former tenant's corpse. You gotta know that's suspicious. But, but it's true. I was led there by the notes he wrote. Once I found the body and called the police, I realized they were gone. And I did shoot someone, but I'm not sure if it was a person. As you testified, but I guess that doesn't matter so much now. I was wary of you because of what you could have done. I didn't want to leave Helena with a madman. If you did anything even a little weird, I was going to turn around and take my wife home. Do you still distrust me? When we first met on the boat, I intentionally told you that I was a detective. Somebody with something to hide would be alarmed. But then you just said cool, so I was a bit less wary. You might be crazy for all I know, but you haven't shown any sign of being dangerous. Listen, everyone's got bad stuff in their past. For somebody who shouldn't know it to dig it up and use it against you, that agitate and anger most people. He knows that well. He's showing off what he knows to upset all of you and control your actions. He's done it to you, to Richard, to Lance. Lance too? He's an ex-journalist. Took photos of that job too. When he published articles, he signed his photos with LK. He investigated the state police during a sexual assault and murder case three years back, but went too far. The victim's family and civil liberties group attacked him for invasion of privacy, and he was driven out of journalism. How do you know about all that, Keith? Doesn't matter. Well, I understand that those are the guy's methods, but how does he know all of our pasts in the first place? The boogeyman lives in your closet, right? So, he's always watching. Watching when you nearly killed your mother. Watching when you were snuggling with your wife in bed. D don't make threats like that. He's only human. The appearance, the weapon, the info, it's all just to scare us. You're taking it pretty well, though. It's all cheap tactics. It's not going to scare me. Yep, that's our detective. Nothing scares him, even though his wife might be in danger. Still calm. If I let myself be shaken, you'd all follow suit. I can't protect anyone if I get distracted. A detective doesn't just go fishing for corpses. I've got my lousy pride and my duty. I can't just watch while someone kills people with a grin on their face. Even if you're forsaking someone important to you? What are you trying to say? There's a big gap between your ideal and what you really want. It's contradictory. Isn't that painful for you? Hmm. I wanted to be a pilot, but thinking about it now, I think I was just too stubborn to see anything else. So? You'll understand someday. Thinking of taking a nap here? Let's go. Keith, those things you said before, were you trying to make me angry? I don't intend on telling anyone your history, nor your family problems. Sorry if you're still pissed. No, it's fine. I guess I am kind of a brat. That was one hell of a conversation. I'm not sure how restful that break really was, but David and Keith seem to trust each other more now. Let this be your final spoiler warning for this game. We're going to be diving into all five endings as well as their requirements, so please skip ahead to the timestamp on screen if you just want my closing thoughts or if you're sensitive towards blood, because there will be quite a bit. 
This game is a lot harder to talk about the endings for in a chronological fashion because of each of the requirements. For every ending to make sense, make sure to watch the bad endings as well. They reuse some of the cutscenes, and I'll only be playing them once each. For the first bad ending, both Sophie and David have to be dead. It doesn't matter how they die, they just have to be dead. That means Keith entered the final graffiti room alone. Keith walks to the other side of the room and takes the stairs. A phone begins ringing once again, triggering a hostile reaction from Keith as well as a flashback. Excuse me. Bearing here? Yes, that's right. I'll be there. Mr. Bearing, sorry to have called you. Your wife said she couldn't look, but we need you to confirm. It's my son. Are you sure? He's wearing the clothes from this morning. My wife sewed his name on then. Todd Baring. Check behind the neck. You have my deepest condolences. Sign here. We'll send you a pamphlet for a mortician. Refer to it if you wish. Thank you. There's a nurse waiting outside. Tell them if you need any help. Now, please excuse me. Helen. It's me. Hey, Keith, you off loitering somewhere? You gotta hurry. The suspect's on the move. Head for Wellington Street. Got it? Don't go. Stay with me. Keith continues forward, going through the gate to his left and up three sets of stairs. There's a lever on the wall that he pulls twice. It makes a horrific grinding noise. Keith goes back downstairs to the gate on the other side of the hall, following it down until he stumbles upon a gruesome scene. The boogeyman stands above the bloodied corpse of Helena, but it doesn't look like she was slashed to death. Oh dear, now I've done it. I thought I'd get the drop on you. But you're always going off somewhere or another, so I couldn't keep up. What an awful curtain closer. But hey, that's how it goes. I've done a lot of harm murdering, and you've done a lot of harm protecting. Life doesn't always go the way you want it, don't you know? Detective, can I ask a question? Who took away the stairs? I suppose we learned what that lever did. Lance wanders the halls, calling out for Keith and Helena. He stumbles upon Keith, cradling Helena's corpse with a cold stare on his face. We cut forward to Keith in an interrogation room with Dick. Why did it have to be her? I can't just say these things happen, can I? It's always on my mind, you know. Guys like us live all bold, but good people keep dying right in front of us. And there's nothing we can do about it. To hell with this. With all of this. Don't hold it in, Keith. You can cry now. I didn't cry when my son died. Keith.
show yourself. Boy, that was awful. But hey, guess it worked out okay in the end. Now I'm able to meet you again. You've got a gloomy look there, detective. Was killing me not enough? Worried about your wife, maybe? Don't worry, she's doing just fine on the other side. With your son, too. Give it back. Give what back? My wife. My son. Give back my family! It wasn't me. It was you! Detective, so you can't even cry normal tears, huh? Give them back? But didn't you just throw it all away? You always focused on your enemy, the one you knew was lurking somewhere. Didn't you notice the ones clinging to your feet? I'm sure you did, but you pretended you didn't, for the sake of your petty, miserable pride. You just pushed them away. I just picked them up. This was how we would always go down, sooner or later. All along, you never even knew. I guess I'll tell you. I am the boogie. The boogie in your head. For the second bad ending, Sophie needs to die, but David needs to live. After the conversation in the graffiti room, Keith realizes that the painting on the wall is a secret passageway, but he isn't strong enough to open it on his own after taking on so many injuries. David helps him out and they explore the new area. While exploring one of the rooms, a phone starts ringing once again. Keith is sick of it and demands that David silence his cell phone, but David claims that no phone is ringing. Heck, David lost his phone earlier, just like Keith did. Keith is visibly upset, mumbling about how he hates the sound of phones ringing. When David asks why, he claims it's because they always bring bad news. This activates the same flashback as the last ending with the death of Keith's son. I'm scared of phones ringing. I feel like someone's going to tell me about a death in a family again. Ever since then, I haven't been able to answer calls. Why'd your son die? Run over by a truck. Driver died instantly. I couldn't blame anyone. I still have idiotic thoughts. Like if I hadn't answered that call, maybe nothing would have even changed. If I'd had been with him, maybe he'd still be alive and smiling. It's completely stupid. It changed nothing. What could I have done? Sorry for grabbing you. I was just confused. Let's go. The two move onwards, going through the left gate and through the room with the lever towards a balcony. Nothing is here, so the duo head to the exit. Ugh. Get back! Keith is now alone. He walks all the way back to the safe room, only to find it entirely empty.
No witnesses. Not a single one. I only just heard about it, so I don't know any details. We're talking with the police there, but they seem confused. Like hell I'm satisfied with confused. Do you know how many deaths we have here? Come on. I'm going to the scene myself. Get everything in order, Eric. Yes, sir. Hey, that? Where'd Mom go? I don't know. Did Mom die? I don't know. Are you lonely, Dad? Yeah. But I've got you here. We'll sleep here until Mom comes back. You okay with it dark? Need a nightlight? I'm fine, cause you're here, Dad. For the third bad ending, Sophie must live, but David must die. Keith goes to the room with the lever through the stairway, not through the painting, since David isn't there to help him. Here he comes face to face with the boogeyman. I've been waiting, detective. Oh dear, what a frightening face. A glare like that. Heck, it even gets me shaking. What got you so angry? Ah, David's death, perhaps? Well, there's no need to worry there, because I'm the one who killed him. It wasn't your fault. Yes, those are the magic words. Aren't they the ones you're always telling yourself every time you confront an innocent person's death? It's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> well, fine by me, detective. You're always biting off more than you can chew, eh? But now you should be asking yourself. Is it because this guy's a murderer that I want to kill him so bad? Whoa there, I know you want to make this quick, but give me a sec. Indeed, once this game is over, you can leave safe and sound. With your wife, too. Yes, your wife is just fine. Well, maybe a little hurt, you know. If you catch me, this oh-so-fun game will finally end. But that's too boring, isn't it? Now, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> You can put up any opposition you like. Nobody to force yourself to protect here. So do as you please. Kill me. Find your wife and go back home. That's a happy ending for you, right? It's time for a boss fight. This is relatively easy. Keith has a very large range, so you can just swing the axe while keeping your distance. Precious box of yours. S it smells rotten. There's a corpse in the box. You're just pretending you don't notice it.
the boogeyman dropped something before Keith threw him from the balcony. It appears to be a key for the right gate. Keith opens that gate, finding Helena tied up. Keith? Keith, thank God. I'm so glad you're alive. Keith, you're hurt. Really hurt. Let me see. Are you okay? This is nothing, but you. It doesn't hurt at all. It's just... I was so scared. I thought you might vanish in front of me, too. I'm sorry. Sorry. I couldn't protect you. Keith. Let's continue our conversation. I'm gonna go with D, the bad one. Give me a week. I'll pack my bags. No, I'll leave. You should stay there. You don't want to let go of the house, do you? All the memories there. A week from now, let's do dinner. I want to talk about some last things. A lot of them. Okay. I want that too. No more beer for you? Yeah, I get sleepy if I drink too much. I'll take you home tonight, so you don't have to worry about that. No, it's fine. I need to be capable of going home alone, even if I'm drunk. Hey, do you remember this? One time, after having a lot to drink, you came home with all this food. And when you got home, you started cooking all of a sudden. I just stared in disbelief while you cooked without a word. Then you said, Okay, eat up, good night, and fell asleep. Did that really happen? <laughs> of course! I couldn't eat it all, so I gave it to you in the morning. And you said, oh, Wow, luxurious. Did you make that in advance? You didn't remember it at all. Gosh, I laughed so hard. <laughs> <laughs> if you think that's funny, I shouldn't tell you what I got up to as a drunk student. You laughed yourself to death. I haven't seen you laugh in forever. Really? If you can smile like that, then I don't mean anything else. Not even me being with you? Sorry, I'll stop. Don't cry, Helena. I want our last meeting to be a fun one. Right. Keith, it's your phone. Keith? Don't answer it. We are unable to take your call at the moment. Please leave your name, number, and a brief message, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Keith, what the hell are you thinking? How can you resign and not tell me about it? I want to talk, please. Call me back, ASAP. I'm waiting. Keith?
A message from Mr. Anderson? So he called the home phone too. Oh, you surprised me. Where were you? Couldn't sleep, though I thought I'd have a drink. Sorry I woke you. Though there was a bottle of spirits in here. Where'd that go? Oh, it's in those drawers. Keys? Helena, you should stay in this house. Todd is here, and so am I. This house was like a box full of treasures to me. Treasures more valuable than life itself. I wanted to protect them at all costs. But I wasn't strong enough. I couldn't protect them. Not Todd, not you. And yet, even knowing my powerlessness, I couldn't let things go. If you're ever born again, I'll pray you never meet me. I'm going to cut things off here in the hopes of not incurring the wrath of YouTube. Let's just say that all three members of the family are now reunited. The final bad ending has almost the same requirements as the true ending, the only difference being that you need to be missing at least one of the secret scenes I mentioned earlier. A good rule of thumb for identifying those is that if there is a videotape, it's a secret scene. Just like in Bad End 2, David and Keith find the secret passageway. The phone rings in the flashback place. We cut to the safe room. I hope Keith and David are alright. It's been so long since they went out. Helena? Thank goodness you're safe! Where's Keith? He went looking for you. Oh, but I'm so glad. Now we'll just wait for those two to return and... Wait! Where are you going? I... I have to go. That man's going to come. He'll catch me. Don't go, Helena! Stay here with us. You'll be all right. Yes, Helena. You should be safe with us. To go out simply isn't... Helena! Lance! What are you thinking? You know how dangerous it is to go it alone? Let go! If I don't run, that man will catch me. So, so then why not stay with us? You gotta calm down, lady. No! If, if I'm caught, Keith will... Keith? What about Keith? Hey, I don't know what you're saying. Hey, wait! <sighs> Where'd she go? Lance, what are you doing out here? You, you guys. Hey, we saw Helena. She was okay. R really? Yeah, but I lost her. We gotta catch up. She should be nearby. I'm taking you back to the room. What? You going deaf? I told you, your woman's close by. And what's the plan if you're attacked? You can't run with that leg. You... Don't you tell me what I can't do! Lance, stop it! You know, that cocky freak is scary. But in my eyes, you're scarier! I'm grateful that you saved me. But past that, you're shady as all get out. I never know what you're thinking. For all the lengths you go to to save people, you never show any emotion. You never get upset. Not to mention knowing all about my past and trying to scare me with that. Just like that other guy. Tell me, why do you know about me? I liked your articles about the Bronx incident. 
They were pretty on point. I was wondering when I could read more, but more never came, because the author had left journalism. Huh? When I heard your name, I had my suspicions, and it turned out I was right. One leading question, and I'd gotten you. I didn't mean to go fishing through your past. I just read your articles. And you talk just like your articles read. Really has that unpleasant attitude. <sighs> you should have told me that before. What'd you have to scare me for? I just wanted to tease you for picking fights with everyone. Want to take it to court? I'll win. I really don't get you. Can't even tell if you're serious or a huge joker. But, I can tell one thing. You're not just an unfeeling Robocop. The whole never shaken thing is just an act, huh? I shouldn't be inviting citizens to panic. Stop saying crap about shoulds and shouldn'ts! Listen, I know. Deep down, you think we're just annoyances. Don't really care what happens to us, because ultimately we're total strangers. And you're sketchy as hell for trying to hide that. Why you gotta hide that? If we're just in your way, say it. Don't go so far protecting us that you'll kill yourself off. If you want to save your woman right now, then do it. Go back to the room, Lance. I'll look for Helena, too. Did you forget what I just said? You're an annoyance. Go away. <laughs> right you are. You go back with Lance. But Keith... I'll be fine. Don't let him get hurt anymore. Go. Wait, I'll take you there. You stick with Keith. What if something happens to you? Shut up! It's fine, you baby face. Baby face? Keith goes to the room with the lever. This time, the boogeyman is waiting. I've been waiting, detective. I'm in a very bad mood right now, because I keep losing to you. Life really doesn't go the way you want it, huh? Even when you try to break up the monotonous days, it just doesn't work out. Sadly enough, even this fun game is almost over. Catch the boogeyman and you win. Happy end. But that's alright. I'll put up a good fight with you, detective. Then we'll see what ending we're getting. It goes one way or the other. Victory or defeat. Nice and simple, right? The boss fight carries out just as before. Who are you? I'm not anyone, detective. Looks like you did things out of order, detective. But still, not bad. Helena? David, where's Keith? We came here together earlier, then we split up. He must be that way. Let's go look for him. Keith! Keith! Please, Keith, get up! Don't move him, Helena. Uh, uh, first we need to stop the bleeding. <sighs> Helena? Are you there? I am. It's okay, Keith. We'll stop the bleeding. I can't see. Blood in my eyes. Helena, you there? No. Please, Keith, please. Hold on. Please. Don't leave me. You're the only one I can't lose.
Helena? Helena, what's wrong? Huh? You were crying. Have a bad dream? I had an awful dream. What was it like? I don't want to remember it. Helena, you need to wake up soon. I want to sleep a little longer. Wake up, Helena. The bad dreams are always the real ones. Were you asleep, Polina? I was dreaming. What kind of dream? A happy dream. Good. I'm glad you can get some sleep. Do you think you can eat anything? I'm done cleaning the storeroom, so I thought I'd make you something. I'm not hungry. You need to eat, Helena. It's not healthy. I'll make you something simple. Thanks for your help, Shirley, but it's fine. You don't have to do anything. I'm just glad you came. If you can get to sleep, then maybe you should sleep. But isn't it chilly by the window? Come to the bedroom. I want to be here right now. It's my favorite place. I always like to see my son coming home from kindergarten, or Keith coming home from work. This must be a great place then. Helena, you remind me of a friend of mine. She got along really well with her husband. So, when her husband left, she was very depressed. She told me that her son's support helped her get her back on her feet. She was a really good person. When I was introduced to her, she told me she was glad to have a daughter-in-law. But I didn't know much about becoming anyone's family. I thought, if my parents threw me away, how could I ever be a part of a stranger's family? And she noticed my worry, so she told me this. While I had an unhappy marriage, through it, I met my beloved son. But not everyone can have such happy meetings. So, if you're unsure, I won't mind if you run away. Ultimately, I let anxiety get the best of me and I ran. And by the time I resolved to come back, she was already gone. I still regret my cowardice, but I know it's too late. David seemed to think that you and Keith didn't get along, but I never thought that for a second. You were always so concerned for Keith, and Keith always sounded kind when he spoke to you. I knew you must have really valued each other. I thought I'd like to be like that myself, but it's not so easy. I still don't know how to go about it. I'm sure you just need lots of wonderful memories. It's okay, Shirley. You two will be just fine. Thanks. Why do the people so close to you always have to go so soon? H Helena, sorry, uh, I was cleaning the living room and I and I broke something. Uh, uh, hold on, what did you break? Uh, a glass cat? Y you broke a Swarovski ornament! What are you doing? That's why I said I should clean the storeroom. You know I'm clumsy. There's even more stuff in there! That would be a disaster! S say what? 
<laughs> you two are just too adorable. There's nothing to worry about, Shirley. You're a wonderful pair. I know you'll get on fine. I don't want any more bad dreams. I'm exhausted. I just want to have happy dreams. Helena! <laughs> Helena. The true ending starts with one big difference. When David asks why Keith hates phones and the flashback plays, there's an extra scene at the end. Helena. Please don't leave without telling me. It makes me worry. It's been a year now. You always stayed with me. You always supported me. But I can't do it. I can't stop the tears. You got back on your feet. But I... I can't do anything but cling to you, but I can't drag you down with my weakness anymore, so... You know what I thought when I saw his body? I thought I failed. Can you believe that? That a parent would think that after losing a child, when it's true. Everyone has one leg in a coffin. If they aren't careful, they can easily fall in. No exceptions. I should have known that. But I didn't. I prayed that my family would be an exception. I wanted them to be there smiling at me forever. When I saw him in the hospital, something died in me. I wanted to kill the one who took my son from me. And you know, some people smile about the deaths of others. I lost all hesitation to punish those people. I thought if they were gone, it would all end. But it'll never end. I still hear someone scoffing at me, saying, You couldn't even protect your own son. It's not your fault. That's what they all say. No! It's what I really think. Then what should I have done? I always felt like such a clown. He died while I was out running around, trying to save others, so the audience just points at me and laughs. I didn't know anything anymore. Why I smiled. Why I cried. Why I got angry. I forgot how I even expressed those things. Even when I saw him dead, I didn't cry. Now it's just you. You're all I have left. I'll keep praying for a sunny day. And until then, I'll be your umbrella. Who will keep you from getting wet? I don't care if I get wet. Helena. If you give up on me someday, then I want you to just forget about me. But please, for my sake, don't leave me alone. Don't cry, Keith. I never cry. No, you're crying. You've always been crying. I'm sorry for hushing my complaints on you. I'll get stronger so I can protect you. Whatever happens, you're someone I never want to lose.
This time, when Keith explains himself and begins to leave, David speaks up. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I know that. No, you don't understand. You're clever, so you're trying to fool yourself, saying, it's not my fault, to convince yourself of that. But you can't fully deceive yourself. Deep in your heart, you still blame yourself. So you desperately try to protect everyone, even people you just met. Protecting people as a detective lets you make up for it. You can replace your guilt with pride and a sense of duty, but that isn't going to save you. Even if you only protect what you really feel is important, no one will blame you for it. Don't act like you know so much. I'm only doing what I should be doing. And you're deceiving yourself with it. You're wrong. I'm not wrong. Then why is my son dead? It's not your fault. Everyone has things they're powerless to help. So stop lying to yourself, please. Just forgive yourself. Let's go. They go to two new rooms this time, one with a single book containing a passcode and one with an old broken video camera. Using the code from the book, Keith unlocks the final door in the hallway, revealing a room where the tape from the broken camera can be played. At last, I finally got a hold of you. Oh dear, hurt all over. But what else could I do? You just wouldn't stop running, miss, no matter how much I hurt you. But ah, well, our game of tags come to a close now. Yes, you can't outrun the scary, scary boogeyman. Are you relieved it's over, or are you still scared? Well, madam, do you want to run? You're an unbelievable idiot. Say again. I called you an idiot. You thought I was running because I was scared. You think maybe you've spent too long in your little closet world to understand. You've convinced yourself that women and children are all scared of you. What were you planning? Once he caught me, kill me, and then what? You'd go to kill Keith, right? You told me you had Keith in your hands. Whether he'd live or die was up to me. I guess that was true. And all this time you've been foolishly chasing after me. You could never kill him. I'm weak. I can't be as strong as Keith is. But there is something I can do in all my weakness. If I can keep your attention away from Keith by running all the time, I'll run to the ends of the earth. You poor, stupid little boogeyman. You really are such a child. You just love bullying anyone weaker than you. Go ahead. Have fun in your little world. Call yourself a villain, a monster. But I'll never let you bring my husband into it. Don't you dare lay a hand on him! You talk too much, madam. Th that's terrible. Let's hurry and look for Helena. She must be nearby. Keith? Keith! What are you doing? We have to hurry. Keith! Are you listening? Hey, what are you staring at? Are you asleep? Get a grip! Come on! I 
I'm awake. David, you look for Helena. She should be near. Huh? W what about you? W what are you gonna do? I'm going to go kill a monster. With David looking for Helena, Keith goes to confront the boogeyman. Wait, Dad? Leave the door open. And don't turn out the lights in the hall. Why? The boogeyman will come. What kind of guy is this boogeyman? He has long nails and kidnaps kids. He lives in the closet. A kidnapper? Well, can't leave a guy like that on the loose. Alright, that'll give him a good beating. Hey, Boogie, you in there? What? The hey, let go! Dad? Dad? Whew, he was a little tough, but I got him good. No worries, son. Old Boogie won't come for you anymore. Really? Would I lie? Me and Mom are in the bedroom right there, you know. You still scared? <laughs> oh, need your stuffed bunny, do you? No, no way! I'm not a wuss, Dad. I can sleep by myself. That's the spirit. Listen, Todd. If the Boogeyman comes to get you again, Dad'll beat him up. Cause you're a police officer? Cause I'm dead. Good night, son. Should I leave the light on? It's okay. I've got you and Mom. Good night. I love you. Don't blame it on the sunshine. Don't blame it on the moonlight. Don't blame it on the good times. Blame it on the boogie. Have you ever thought about it, detective? Thought you have an enemy? Who or what it is, you don't even know. Maybe it doesn't even exist. Maybe. It's all in your head. But you know there's something tormenting you. Always making it so, so painful. You feel like the whole world's out to make you suffer. Too troublesome to make an enemy of the whole world, right? So just making one enemy will do. I chose you as my enemy. Have I become yours? Oh well, either way, we're gonna settle this right here. Let's end this wonderful game now. Can you beat this final boss and take back your beloved wife? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Boy, you're really having a blast, huh? What's so funny that you can be all smiles all the time? Total opposite of me. I don't remember the last time I laughed. But I guess we were pretty similar after all. In a sense, it was all a lie. You're always grinning ear to ear, but you're scared, aren't you? So you keep running. You can't go head to head with me. You and me are just acting. You're no scary monster, and I'm no paragon of justice. Final boss? Ha! <laughs> a big baddie should be a pretty sly guy, shouldn't they? But taking hostages, always on the run, the only thing you can chase after is girls' rumps. 
You know, I wasn't planning to do anything with you. As long as the elders were safe, I was fine leaving you be. I'd secure your hostages and scram, then just leave you to the local police. Because I'm not chasing you. You just keep running from me. What I'm really chasing after. Sorry, but it ain't you. That's right. It's not you. You're my enemy. Spare me the sleep talk. Why would I make my enemy a dunce who just sneaks away? A coward who hides in the closet and threatens kids. And your enemy? Not me either. You've got a lot more enemies. If you go to the slammer, you're going to be a real popular guy. I can tell. But this is a great chance. No hostages to get in the way. No one watching. So I can do whatever I like with you. Detective. Criminal. That doesn't matter now. You've done the number one thing to get on my bad side. You chased after my wife's rump. That alone is enough reason for me to beat you down. Don't you think, Boogie? Can't afford to laugh anymore, can you? Back to your closet, boogeyman. You don't have what it takes to make it over here. The boss fight begins one final time. Where do you think you're going, Lance? I'm gonna find them. They've been gone way too long. Did you forget what he said? It'll be a burden on him to move around on our own. On that after all is said and done, we'll tell him we did just what he said. Of course, you might have all gone stone cold by that time. Don't joke about things like that. Sounds like a joke to you? Uh, we got two, maybe three corpses around here? What part of don't, don't you get? Stop, you two. Don't fight. We'll go search together. I'll lead the way. Sophie and Shirley, you hold hands. And Lance, you watch the rear. P papa You really want to go? Yes, we'll be alright together. And there's something I'm curious about. What's that? This whole incident may just be a great big farce. What do you mean? Let's be going. Helena? Where are you? Helena? <laughs> Helena! David! Are you okay? I... That man knocked me out. I woke up here. I was unconscious the whole time. Keith! Helena! Keith! Where are you? Always on the run, huh? What's in that big head of yours? Brendan? You, Liz. Detective. Keith! 
You, you're Brendan? Why? Stop moving around. Keith, Helena. We have to stop the bleeding. Lance! Richard, help me out. S Sophie, find something to tie him with. Keith! <laughs> Got you. Helena, when we get home, let's finish our conversation. No more running. No! Keith, stay with me, please! Keith! Uh, the servants and Stevie. Ten people died, all told. I'm sure glad to be alive now. Feeling glad to even have air to breathe. Listen, don't you say a word about all this. Especially not to your co-workers. If it takes money to shut your yap, I'll pay any price. Ho ho ho! Bribery! Where's that money coming from? In my own pockets. Listen. You guys can distort the truth all you want, and I won't say a peep, because that's freedom of the press. But this? This is different. I've got no tolerance for people pointing and laughing at a wounded friend. Do I gotta tell you again? I'm not a gossip guy. <laughs> I hate cops, sure, but I hate gossip too. I won't ask for money, and I won't say a peep, because I'm grateful to the guy. So quit hounding me. But, as an involved party, I've got a right to know what happened there. I just can't wrap my head around it. I talked to Brendan at dinner. Heard he got tired of the musty old castle and ran to Hollywood. Had a lot of fun in the movie biz. So what was the motive? Guy's gone silent. Sounds like he convinced you he was a goody two-shoes. But I bet you heard a different story in Hollywood. Now that's the kind of thing your lot should be writing about. Nobody knows people's past, usually. But it's easy to fool you into thinking otherwise with a little acting. And once you know somebody's past, you can lead them by the nose. He tricked you all, and tried to kill you. What a farce. Not sure of the motive yet, but he was pretty systematic about it all. Spent a ton of cash beforehand to check up on all the tour attendees. Even did a background check on me. On you? Why? Because I was going to be on that tour. No wonder I thought he knew me. The hell, so he just researched us? That's the oldest trick in the book for us. Saying, I know all about you. It makes you superior to the other person. So you can, uh, control them. Then they freak out and have to submit. He knew that tactic well. Seeing right through people without any tricks. That's what makes a real monster, ain't it? In his case, he just used money and connections to dig up people's past and played the part of a monster. But the research wasn't to select candidates. So he just picked randomly. Damn, was he just in it for fun? Now, my turn to ask questions. What you tell me is the only way I can figure out this incident. Give me anything you got. First, Brendan, or Bookie Rapper, what kind of man was he? How should I say it? I suppose he had no emotion, that's how I saw him. He said such terrifying things without a care. He hardly showed any human feelings. He really was like a monster. Keith told me he was a real jester. Jester? Absolutely not. I would have much preferred if he were at least a little silly. He was a very disturbing, terrifying man. He was totally calm as he did awful things. Richard, you seem to have a suspicion he might be Brendan. What do you think that? 
When my daughter went missing, and I panicked, thinking that man might have taken her, Keith told me something. This was the kind of person who would show corpses as decoration, so if he did take Sophie, he'd show off proof of it, meaning she was still safe. Luckily enough, I didn't see them, but, indeed, evidently, there were many dead bodies left around. As Keith said, my daughter hadn't fallen into his grasp. He was correct in his assumption. That made me realize something unusual about what he'd said. Keith said he saw the moment Brendan's neck snapped, and his corpse was quickly dropped into the basement. Isn't that odd? Why did he quickly put Brendan's corpse out of sight? Why did he treat him differently from the other victims? Because he didn't want you investigating it. He's got some keen insight. I'll give him that. So you suspected this was a farce plotted by Brendan? No, well, I just... I suggested that since Keith hadn't checked the corpse, he might still be alive. I only wanted to believe there was a chance he was alive. I had no conviction about the rest. So I didn't speak about it to Keith. I wouldn't dare risk throwing him off with my amateur opinion. Not to mention we didn't know whether his wife was safe. Apparently, Keith saw the moment Brendan's head came off, actually. Was it a doll? Right you are. Packed with neat little blood packs, it seems. Brendan was hung upside down and had his mouth taped up, and it was dark enough to be hard to tell who's who. Just dressing him up the same way made Keith assume it was him. On top of all those flashy rave lights, he dropped the corpse down below so it was impossible to check it closer. And since Keith saw the tour conductor killed right after that, of course, he'd think Brendan was killed too. If I'd said something, maybe this could have been resolved sooner, but I was paralyzed with fear. I was only worried about my daughter. Even when Keith was running all over the place for us. Don't worry about it. Keith did all that because he wanted to. That's all. He's deeply glad you're all safe. Now, little lady, can we hear from you too? Hear what? Anything. What you thought. What you noticed. Well, I knew he was a fake. Because I've met the real boogeyman. Sophie, stop it. Not this tale again. Fine, if you say so, Papa. Guess I'm not saying a word. Go ahead, please. Meeting the real boogeyman sounds pretty juicy. Can you tell me more? Maybe not really met. He just touched my shoulder. But his hand was cold as ice. Right away I knew it wasn't human. That guy's hands were human, though. They had warmth, so I knew he was just a regular guy. Ha! Huh. So Boogeyman's hands are cold, eh? Uh, tell that to my little squirt. Anything else you noticed? I feel like he might get angry if I say this. I won't. Tell me. That guy had this cold and emotionless air, like you couldn't tell what he was thinking at all. It reminded me of Mr. Keith, a little. You still think that way now? Not even, because Mr. Keith got really mad at me. He was like, Don't worry your papa ever again! Red paint? On his... face? It was nothing like that. It was all red from blood spurts, though. Really? Keith told me he had a weird paint on a torn paper bag. And one more thing. Did you see any red graffiti in the castle? Or any monsters? Hear any phones ringing? No, I didn't. Mr. Hoover, you're colorblind, if I recall. Maybe you just couldn't see the pink. Yeah, but it's white and pink I get mixed up. I can see red just fine. Well, uh, and you, miss? I saw quite a bit of the castle, but none of that. Did you hear that from the others? Don't get me wrong. I don't think you're lying. The others said they saw nothing, too. But then, that makes Keith the one talking nonsense. I don't think Keith is necessarily lying. 
What do you mean? Because people don't always see the same things you do. Thanks for the assistance, you two. Sorry about calling you in two weeks after the fact. Is not everything settled yet? The police there are in the middle of their investigation. My role is just to assist. I'm going to report your testimonies to them, and that's that. I'll be off now. Eric, take them to the entrance. When her son died, I thought my own life was over too. I couldn't think about anything. Nothing had any taste. But tears would suddenly come anyway. I don't remember anything about what I did back then. That Keith was always at my side. When I wailed and shouted, he'd hug me, stroke my hair, say it was okay. Eventually, I adjusted to life without her son. I found I could laugh again. But when I got my own emotions back, I realized Keith had stopped laughing. I had been broken, and so had Keith. Over time, I was able to heal, but he didn't. He was still stuck in the moment of thought. He was always supporting me, so he never faced up to himself. I struggled to be at least a little stronger. Next time, I would protect him, since I wanted him to laugh again. But I couldn't. I, I couldn't repeat anything to Keith. And I realized I was a burden on him that would keep him from ever walking again. So, even if we're far apart, as long as he can laugh again, then that's the best choice I can make. My wife always brings me more milk before I go to bed. And last Farmer's Day, my little squirt tried cooking me a meal. I definitely don't need milk to get to sleep. And the kids cooking, I'll be blunt, it ain't good. But I'm glad for it. Usefulness and collateral don't mean a thing with this stuff. Keith didn't stay close to you expecting something in return. That's... You guys, have got too much sympathy. You don't mind getting hurt for the sake of the other. But can't you notice that one of you being hurt hurts the other? You've just been getting more and more wounded as you go along. You're propping Keith up too, Helena. He can fight day after day, because he knows you're waiting at home, as much as I tease him about it. Don't think of yourself as baggage. Depend on him as much as you need. That's what he wants too. Keith grabbed my hand and smiled, even though he was stabbed and wounded. And what do you say? Got you. Because he finally got what makes him happiest. But, man, too much discrepancy between your guys' testimonies and Keith's. Just how am I going to report this to their department? Hey, Helena, he went back home from the hospital today, right? Can I come talk with him now? I'm sorry. Before he goes back home, there's a place he's going to visit. And I'm planning to head there myself. Keith. Uh, 
I had always wanted to cry like this. Uh, I never forgot about him. Not for a single day. Ever since he died, I was scared. I felt like even the slightest sign of weakness would make it all crumble. I acted like I felt nothing, like nothing disturbed me. I thought then I might be able to fool everyone, even myself. It was so stupid. I was broken a long time ago. It was all garbage, but I acted like a champion of justice. It always felt off. Whoever I was working for, I never felt repaid. And I saw you were safe, and you came up to me. Finally, I felt happy again. Acting strong just made me weak. It was pointless. Todd would never forgive his father staying broken forever, because I promised I'd protect his mom. Take off the blindfold. I'm gonna laugh, even if it's at a stupid TV show. If I'm pissed, I'll get mad. And if I'm sad, I'll cry. First, I guess there'll have to be counseling. There's something seriously wrong with my head, seems like. It's gonna be a busy time. And it's gonna be so busy, I won't be able to do it alone. Helena, I don't think I can deal with just being a good loser. I want a chance. Let me chase after you. Let me get down on my knees. You're the only one I want waiting for me. There's no need for a chance. Didn't I tell you? Divorce or decide. I've decided, haven't you too? We only ever have one umbrella, so we hold it together. And it's fine if we get a little wet, because... It'll soon be sunny again. There's one final bonus scene after this that takes place. It's not playable like what we had in the Sandman, it's just an extra cutscene. How many times have we come here again? Oh, five, I think. Ugh, I can't stand it! We've told them the same story over and over! There's gonna be rumors at school about Sophie frequenting the police station. Now, Sophie, don't complain. The police are doing their best. And it's been a month now. This must be the last time. I'm sure of it. <sighs> Does my princess require a beverage to quell her temper? What shall it be, your majesty? Orange juice. Very well. I'll go buy some. Thanks. Hey. When those dogs attacked me, you saved me, right? I can't imagine any other reason those dogs would fall asleep so quickly. Thanks. I'm having a great time lately. I'm getting along great with Papa and Anne, and Reagan... Well, if she wants to get along, I'll give her a chance. Things are so much better than when I carried all my burden myself. Now I know, there's someone always looking out for me. Sometimes, I really miss you. You're doing okay, right? How about the other fairies? You know, I...
Sorry to butt in. Ah! Hold on, wait. You got the wrong idea. I I'm not a weirdo or anything, okay? Don't touch me. Brats with a thing for daydreaming aren't the most comfortable people to be around. I I'm not daydreaming. C keep it between us, but I've met some... some fairies. <laughs> so you don't believe me? No, I do. I met one when I was a kid, too. Really? Yeah. This hobo in the area always had a head full of dandruff, so I called him the dandruff fairy. Oh yeah, and I've got a co-worker who eats non-stop cup noodles, the cup noodle fairy. Want to be introduced? Why won't you believe me? A 37-year-old who believes in fairies ain't exactly socially adjusted, don't you think? But hey, if they do exist, put in a request to one of your fairy friends to get me some wings. Big, fluffy pink ones. What do you use those for? Just want some wings. Why not? Mr. Detective wanna fly away. Huh. You angry? Phew. <laughs> Better step off. One of your friends might cast a spell to turn me into a fluffy white kitty. Maybe instead of filling your head with stupid fantasies, fill in that chest a little. It's so pathetic I can't even look at it. Ugh! What's wrong? I haven't been able to sleep since last night, even though I'm sleepy. It's weird. Did you take any medicine? Yep. Anxiolytics. Sleeping pills. Guess they're not working. Let's talk to each other then. Before you know it, you'll be sound asleep. And it'll be morning. Don't you need to sleep? You don't have to stay up for me. <laughs> it's fine. I'll stay with you until you're snoozing away. Maybe some exercise would have been better. So that was The Boogeyman. It is by far my favorite in the series. The story wasn't as emotionally driven as the other two, but the mystery more than made up for it in my eyes. I guess it panders more to my story preferences, but most people who watch these understand the general concept of having opinions, so I'm not too worried. It has the best gameplay in the series by a landslide, with great puzzles throughout. Needing to save your friends creates a lot of tension, and there are real consequences if you mess up. There are a few quirks here and there, especially with what order you pick things up, but for the most part it was great. The only real issue I had with the gameplay was navigation, since the map is huge and you don't really get a lot of guidance. The connections to the past games were really enjoyable to see and it endeared me to David and Sophie even more than before. You can tell that after The Crooked Man, Uri was ready to connect all the other games to each other in increasingly interesting ways. I'm super excited to hopefully see all three past protagonists return in The Hanged Man. This game was simultaneously the funniest and darkest in the series. The Boogeyman was a terrifying villain, and he kept tensions very high. Working against a madman instead of a mysterious otherworldly being made it a lot more interesting in my eyes. This is the longest I've ever spent making a video, so I'd really appreciate anyone checking out my Patreon in case YouTube decides that the content was too dark. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.